Hello, Brilliant Jewelry community. Nowadays, you can just go to any AI, ask for a jewel image, load your image in an AI mesh generator, save the 3D model, ask one of my cats what she thinks about this, open Blender, file, import, GLB, bring the 3D mesh to Blender, and after a couple of adjustments, like cleaning the side space and preparing the position of the gems without forgetting the perfectly beaded prongs, we get a perfect looking ring ready to create a new 3D jewelry animation in Blender Cycles. Obviously, we could perfectly create this 3D jewelry animation using AI tools, but that would be a complete creative mayhem, and maybe you still want to learn something. Let's get started. So when starting an animation, we should first optimize the geometry. In this animation, I'm going to need a high resolution model for the rendering and also a low resolution model for the collision with the liquids. This means I've made a copy of the model. I'm going to join the gems and the metal. Now I'm going to add a decimate modifier. Let's go very low at 0 0.5. I just want a couple of hundred thousand faces and apply the decimate modifier at once. Obviously, this will affect the geometry, but this will only be a crash test dummy for the collision, so the model can be rather ugly. I'm going to repeat the decimate modifier until I get a really lower face count, apply the decimate, and this will be the crash test dummy. Now save a separate file, splash ring animation, liquid sim and erase the high resolution model from this scene. Save again and be happy again. Now, they say that size doesn't matter. It's true most of the time, but the size of the object matters a lot for liquid simulations. So I'm going to put it at three meters. I'm going to copy the scale and apply the scale. Now also the materials, because think about the rendering right from the start. The high resolution model has the gems, diamonds, and the gold. To separate the objects, it's easier when you want to join and then separate again the objects by materials. But for the dummy, let's get rid of the materials. Now we're going to add a mesh sphere. Let's make it slightly bigger than the ring. Let's put it to the right side. Now let's go to object, quick effects, quick liquid. You should already see something when running the simulation like this. If it doesn't work, it's generally because the scale of the object is way too big or the amount of geometry is way too high. But if you're following the simple steps I'm giving you right now, you should have something like this running. Now we have the liquid domain selected. We're going to scale it first like this and then on the x-axis so we can embrace the ring so there from the top view, I can move the domain like this. Check the position also on the z-axis here. From frame one, run the simulation again to see if it's not completely broken. If it breaks, it will be mostly because you made the domain too big. Now, just let's go to solid view. Okay, some settings in the output properties. Frame range and let's put something far, far away, a thousand. Now on the liquid domain um, in the physics tab, down here, the cache, the end, let's go at 2000. So we can see the simulation pretty far there. Now on the sphere, also in the physics properties, we're going to turn on the initial velocity. Let's play with the numbers. So we're going to go to the left, that's negative on the x-axis, more. Always recheck the simulation from frame one, that's too much. Test again. Okay, now we're going to go up slightly. Check it out. A bit less on X, a bit more on Z. Readapt, retest. We want to meet the ring at the middle. Good, now when I play the animation, it's very basic and it's also too fast. So first, let's select the liquid domain. Let's go to physics and in the time scale, I'm going to reduce it at maybe 0.25. Go back to frame one test okay something like this because i want the contact between the liquid and the ring to be more like a slow motion effect it's going to be more impressive and now we're going to add keyframes for the ring because i don't want the ring to stand there and to just be hit by a blob of whatever liquid we're going to create okay so select the ring and now we're going to have a look at where the contact starts starts somewhere here and i want the ring to be more like with the gem to the front, somewhere here. So at this frame, I'm going to keyframe 
eye on the location, eye on the rotation. Also the scale, very probably I won't use the scale, but most of the time you keyframe a bit more data because who knows, it's a better strategy. So then let's go to frame one and I want the range to be somewhere here and I'm going to rotate it because I want the range to spin. So let's put it there on frame one and let's run the show. We'll have to tweak some movements. I don't want the ease in is out. Okay, let's go at the metal keyframe and let's multiply it by two. And now I want the ring to continue to the other side there. Also rotate and go down. Now let's keyframe this. Let's go back to frame one and play. Okay. The trajectory is pretty good, up and down, like thrown away with gravity. Never do that to a jewel in real life. It would be very bad. But these are the benefits of 3D jewelry creation. We can have more fun than in real life sometimes. Okay, so obviously the rotation is wrong because it's coming back. But for that, we'll have to go to the animation workspace. We're going to ask for the graph editor. We're going to scale with the middle mouse and control key you can scale the proportion live directly there in the window that's very practical in blender now n to close that window and open the data okay so first let's hide everything and let's go to frame one zoom out a bit okay so the first problem is the rotation on the z-axis here we can see that it's going to rotate on itself the z-axis is the up and down so when it rotates on the z-axis it's around that axis and if it goes up and down it means that it comes back so it means that the last frame i want it to go up like this then also we can see that the curve is smooth, but that's not what we need now because smooth means that the curve is easing. And now we want a straight dynamic. So select everything with A, hit V on your keyboard to get the handle type menu and do it as a vector. So now let's go to the front view and let's run the animation. Okay, that's a bit better. Okay, so now here I have a slight problem because the lines are breaking at the middle keyframe. So I need to correct that. I can just erase this keyframe. And now we need to do something similar for the other location or rotation curves here in the graph editor. I won't always remove the middle keyframe to keep it as a time marker and reference for the rest of the animation. And sometimes I won't use the vector here, by example, on the Z axis, I just want the ring to go directly up and then go straight back down. That's removing the ease in and ease out of this trajectory. And this is what we get. The ring is going to hit the liquid in rotation for this part of the animation. So don't forget to save and be happy. Okay, now let's go back to layout and now remember that I told you to create this crash test dummy low resolution version of the ring because we're going to go to physics for the ring fluid type effector collision. We're going to turn on the collision on the ring with the liquid. Okay, testing. So, mm, okay, we can see the ring is slowing the liquid down and now Clearly, anyway, we need to rise the resolution of the liquid simulation and then test proper collision settings for the ring and the liquid. So first, we're going to rise the resolution on the domain. Obviously, the calculations are going to start to be slower and slower, but that's how it goes when we want a very precise liquid simulation. So at 100 for the resolution of the domain, we're starting to get a better collision. But also, we want the particles to be more and smaller to have a nicer splash. And then also looking at the width of my sphere, I'm going to make it wider to cover the ring more properly. So sphere edit mode, wider on the Y axis, something like this. And also I'm going to make the geometry a bit more random by hand. So proportional editing, and I'm going to deform my emitter. So it's important to adapt the geometry of the fluid emitter. Now also on the sphere, if necessary, raise the surface emission to have more liquid coming out and reach the entire ring as you like. So from zero, I'm going to go to two from a maximum of 10. So there's still margin there to adapt the simulation. And this is the result. It splashes on the ring. 
and the ring goes through. So to get this on the ring, the collision effector sampling is really high and the surface thickness to give some distance between the liquid and the ring is not at zero. So it really wraps around the object, in this case, the ring. Then also this is the geometry of my original sphere, a lot of smaller spheres. Then also I'm not starting at frame zero and I move the liquid closer to the ring, less calculation. The sampling substeps is really high. Five is the highest. The surface emission is not at zero, so we get more liquid and I adapted the initial velocity. And also a small trick here in the scene, the gravity, you can adapt it. So I lowered the gravity so the liquid goes up more easily than on the domain. So typical, the resolution division, 168, that's not too high. Then the CFL number, normal is two. At four, calculations are faster. And also the time steps, maximum and minimum, I set them at one instead of four and one. Calculations are faster. I'm not using any border collisions. That changes the simulation even with the same settings, beware. Then on the liquid, the flip ratio is pretty small to get small smaller splashes. The particle radius is 0 0.5 instead of 1. I'm not using any randomness because my geometry is pretty random at the beginning, so that's pretty good. Then the particle maximum and minimum, that's twice the default and three times the default. Then the narrow band is at 0. If you start putting numbers, you're going to get a lot more particles, yes, but also a lot more calculations. Then for the mesh, the uprest factor is at 5, that's the maximum. Particle radius at 2, and then the concavity upper, I used 3 instead of 3.4. It makes the particles come together a bit more. Then, like I said earlier, I'm starting the animation at frame 300. And the end frame is at 1200, which is way too much in my case, because in fact, all the interesting movement ends around frame 600. So obviously I stopped the calculations because it's useless to waste time on useless frames. And then just a small detail for the precision volume, I'm using full float numbers because I think it was better on my CPU, but whatever. So for today, that's already a lot of work. Give it a try to AI mesh modeling. You'll see, it's a lot of fun. And then come to Blender and start creating this 3D jewelry splash animation. Obviously, this tutorial is to be continued. You already have a lot of work to do anyway. Let's get to it. Take care, have a nice day, and see you soon.